Let's welcome Josh. Uh, Josh is uh, him and Jen and Hudson, who probably is in the baby room. Is he in the baby room right now? Yeah. Hi, Hudson. Uncle Steve loves you. Loves you lots and loves Jen. Hi, Jen. The, we've got a baby room, so my safeguarding was, I don't think you could all could go in there, but I could tell you where it was if you want to rest. It's got an overflow. It's great. It's very comfortable. Some great toys in there. But uh, Josh leads a Freedom Church in Hull, which was planted from Jubilee Church Hull, uh, right up in the north part of Birmingham. It's a beautiful place. Oh, Birmingham. Oh, I'm in Birmingham. Where do I live? Birmingham. I'm in Hull. Beautiful. It's because we prayed so much for it before we planted it. Uh, up in the, the north of the city. Uh, beautiful estates up there. Incredible people. Uh, lots of complicated lives and situations. But these guys have been really faithful. It is hard work. As many of us know, being pastors and planting churches is not all easy. Sometimes it's really tough. Some people come with you and then decide it's easier to go back and be more settled in a bigger church, but they've got some real pioneers, so well done, guys. I'm oh, sorry, there's one lady who has gone back, but anyway, maybe God's going to speak to you. <laughs> Come back again. I just remembered that. She booked him as freedom, but she's gone back. But anyway, no condemnation, Sandra. Um, sometimes it's... <laughs> I've really dug myself a hole. i tell you what, Abdullah, we love Josh, don't we? No. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> No, save it. Save, save me. Come and pray. I will save you. I will save you. Now you know why we are enjoying church planting in Birmingham so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. You pray. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we pray for, for Josh? Come on, let's stretch our hands to, towards him. And yeah, Father Lord, thank you for your hand over Josh. Thank you for who he is and what you have done in his life. Thank you for Jen. Thank you for Hudson. Thank you for your hand over them as a family. Lord Jesus, all that you have poured into this man, Lord God, today, let him free, feel every freedom in this place, Lord. Prepare our hearts, our minds, Lord Jesus, to receive all that you have for us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you, brother. Thanks. Brilliant. I was, I was going to say, I was going to call out Sandra for something else, actually, but then I feel like there's... It's a bit too much. I was in the baby room earlier. It is very comfortable, as, as Steve has said. And I can see just about starting from the back of Sandra's head. And when uh, it was said by Tony that I was going to bring something meaty, I could see there was a little snicker that went on here. Um, <laughs> but I won't call that out. I won't call that out now. I think Steve has done enough damage as it is. If you've got your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 9? Acts chapter 9, we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 19. It will come up on the screen as well. Acts chapter 9, 1 to 19. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he, may be, uh, that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his, his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. 
But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptised and taking food, he was strengthened. Lord, I, I just pray uh, as we hear your words spoken this morning, as we uh, bring ourselves to these things that you want to show us uh, the, together now, that you would be uh, speaking to our hearts and equipping us for the things that we're going to receive over these days. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be on me as I unpack these things that you've uh, given to me, and I pray that they would be, it would also be on uh, my friends here as they receive these words, and that all of us together would be equipped to do these great works that we know that you have called us to in Christ. We ask this in your mighty name, Lord. Amen. Amen. It is great to gather like this, and already I've I've been enjoying uh, catching up with a few people. Just the quick hellos as you grab as you bustle your way to a coffee. You have to go elbows out, don't you? But it's great to be here, and I do love these gatherings. I think they have been so key for us over the years as we've uh, come together and enjoyed time together as we gathered to God as we've uh, responded to uh, some key words that I think we've. Uh, we've had, and already it feels like as we've been worshipping, there have been some things that have come out that I think are going to be shaping these days together. Um, I always come to uh, these gatherings with high expectations, and I feel, uh, particularly as we've uh, been in the build-up to coming here in Birmingham, I've felt such a sense of uh, what the Lord wants to do, and I've, I've come with high expectations, as I say, as we, as we meet together with God and as we hold up again this great call and vision that we share in, this, this work that we have uh, set ourselves to and have been called to by God to carry the name of Jesus into all the world. These times have also, I believe, in the as we've, as we've come to settings like this, they have been course-setting times for us. Right? We, uh, you know, you a quick glance around the room and you'll see people who have moved and have been faithful in their response in, in laying things down and picking things up and, and moving houses and moving cities and moving nations. Uh, you'll see that across the room. From places, settings like this, the Lord has spoken and set a course for us. And... and we weren't able to be with you in Worthing, but having caught up with the, the sessions online, we see that there have been key uh, messages that have come out of those times as well. You know, with some of the, the prophetic words that we're carrying as, as churches of new eras and of a renewed uh, emphasis on reaching the unreached and on an acceleration into church planting. Those things have, have been born out of times where people have gathered together in this way. In Worthing, uh, those, those key words of, of uh, as Fusi uh, uh, came and was, was with you guys and was sharing about what it means to, to be faithful in following the Lord in, in the promises and in, in the obedience of following that trickle and, and calling us to, to look again and to set our eyes on, on Europe in a very practical way. We, we have a call to see churches planted across the uh, continent of Europe. And then as Rodney came and he shared what was on his heart of what it means to be a people really uh, led by and engaging with and keeping pace with the prophetic. And using the Macedonian call as, as a way of, of engaging uh, what the Lord is doing amongst us at the moment. And, I th and I, I, as you kind of look to those times, you think you can't help but come to this and think, well, what is, what is God going to do here? I believe uh, you know, we've had even in gatherings like this, you might call them uh, Antioch moments, where the Lord speaks and people are moved, right? You know, in Acts 13, where the, those leaders are gathered together, they're, they're worshipping and they're fasting together, and the word comes, set apart Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I've called them. Again, you look around this room and you'll see people who have been moved by such calls, as those words have come, as God has spoken and directed. 
And even the fact that we're here in Birmingham, right, is a response to such an Antioch moment. Four years ago, we were down in the, uh, the, the UK hub down in London, and we were prompted to begin to pray for Birmingham. No one, as far as I'm aware, was looking towards Birmingham. No one was thinking, this is where uh, I'm called. No one was uh, holding uh, church planting in Birmingham in their hearts. And, and God spoke and he prompted us and we began to pray. And then the next day on the back of the metro uh, was uh, the, the Virgin Rails ad, which said, uh, where do you see yourself in five years time? If the answer's Birmingham, we can, we can get you there faster. And... Again, we, we came to the next day having seen that and it prompted us to pray again. And then from that, over the years, uh, we've seen people move. And alongside that, we've, the people unbeknownst to us who were also being stirred towards Birmingham. Great to have Brian and Sarah with us as well, uh, who we sent from Freedom Church. Great privilege of ours, even as a church plant, to be able to send into the work that God is doing. And so even the fact that we're here is a testament to those moments, uh, that how God has spoken uh, in these times. And so, with all that in mind, as we look at both our experience and scripture and how the Lord speaks to his people and through his people, it is right and appropriate that we should come to these days anticipating similar movements. It was great. I um, came in a bit late, so I was asking Steve what these pieces of paper were. As, as he said, you know, if, you, if God is calling you or feel like there's a prompting for a, a town or a city, to write that down and, and, and we're going to keep note of those things, those prompts. And, and I'm anticipating that there are going to be more Antioch moments coming from these, these days. But so whilst Antioch is a, a key time, both for in the history of the church and individually for for. Paul and, and Barnabas, as they are stirred, you know, the, the, the movement, as it were, is, is directed and it, its course is set, re- release these guys, and, and a trajectory is set, and these guys themselves, their, their call is, is renewed and launched into action. Uh, as, as, as crucial and key a time that is, it's not the time that Paul's going to point back to later in his life as, as the key event that commissioned his work. And when he's explaining, what is it you're doing Paul, what is it you're about? What is it you're for? Uh, why are you doing these things? As he's making that defense, as he's making his case for, this is what I've lived my life for, later on in the book of Acts, he's going to point back not to Antioch, but to Damascus. He's going to be pointing to Damascus. And so that time of, uh, I, I suppose, when the Antioch call comes, Paul is there reading it through his Damascus call. He's he's reading it through that that first call that he received from the Lord when he was confronted on that day. He is able to receive what he he gets on that day in Antioch because of what he received on this day in Damascus. Because of how God spoke to him, how God transformed him, how he changed him, how he... uh, Uh, met with him and called him, he is able to understand and receive those things that come in Antioch. And so when he hears those words set apart Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I've called them, he hears them knowing, I know what I've been called to. I know to whom I belong. I know what my life is for. I know what it's about. I know. And so that Antioch word kind of comes with a, it, when you read it, it looks a bit vague, but it's clearly not received vaguely because off they go, off they go into church planting, off they go into mission internationally. Because, I believe, because at that moment, Paul receives that and recognises, I know what I'm called to. I know what I've been uh, set apart for. I know what I belong to. I believe that much of what we see in Paul's theology in his view of his ministry, in his view of the church and how Jesus relates to the church and of suffering and the purpose of, of suffering in mission. I believe all of those things have their root, at least in part, in this moment he, when he is encountering Christ on the road to Damascus. 
All of those things. These great uh, words and works of Paul all have their origin in, in, in his understanding of what the church is and what it's for and, and his role in it have their origin in the Damascus core. So what I want to do just this evening with the time that we've got, I want us to read, I suppose, read Antioch through Damascus, as I suppose Paul must have done. To read Antioch through Damascus. And as as we do that, I hope to uh, be able to prepare our hearts. I hope that we can prepare our hearts to be able to receive some of the, the things that I believe that God is going to be speaking us to about over these days. Some hard things, I believe. I believe there are going to be some things. There are going to be some hard calls that are going to put demands on us. And I believe we've got, to, we've got to understand those fundamentals of who is it I've been called by and what is it I've been called to do. The foundation of all of Paul's life and ministry from this point on, from Acts 9 on, is this encounter with Jesus. Having met him face to face and seen him for who he is, Paul is going to be equipped to do the things that we see him do, to suffer in the way that he's uh, going to suffer, to to do those mighty works, to preach in the way that he's called to. All of his life and ministry starts there. And and, and in in that encounter and in the transformation that comes from it. Here is Paul on his way to Damascus, Damascus, breathing out threats and murder. Right? That's just who he is, out of, out of depth. That's all that is there in him. He just breathes it out. It just, he is the source of just death and anger and hatred. And he encounters one who says to him, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And this confrontational moment turns into grace as he's, as he's received into the family of faith and he is baptised. And he is given a call. He's not only saved in that moment, but he is wonderfully given a new commission and a new calling. Right? He's, he's coming to Damascus with letters from the high priests. Right? He's coming to Damascus with a, a commission. And yet, as he arrives, he finds himself given an altogether different one. And those letters are left blowing in the wind somewhere on the road. He came, he was one thing. He met with Jesus and he left another. He came with one purpose and he met with Jesus and he left with another. With new life comes new purpose. And Paul recognises himself now not just uh, with... uh, kind of caught up in the priorities of the world or in vain religion, but now he, uh, he recognises himself as being, I am a chosen instrument. I am set apart, as it's put in Acts 13. I'm, I'm set apart. I'm a, I'm a chosen instrument. I belong to the Lord. He's been made, he's made aware that he no longer belongs to the world with its priorities. He doesn't belong to those things. He doesn't belong to the, to the priorities that he sees in the world around him. He belongs to Jesus and he belongs to him for a, an end, for a purpose. In, a, in Exodus 25, you have this moment where um, uh, Moses comes to the people having been instructed by the Lord and he says, right, the Lord, we're going to build uh, the tabernacle with its, with its great uh, uh, instruments and its uh, uh, the thing, the things that are going to be there to serve the Lord, we're going to build it. It's going to look like this, and and there's a free will offering. And he says, anybody who who feels moved, bring what you have. And so you see people bringing household goods, spare building materials, and even personal treasures. They all come, and they are transformed from being household goods, personal treasures, and spare building materials into being holy objects set apart for the work of God. They're sanctified. They've been made into something else. They, they don't belong to those things. Those copper jugs that you pulled out when your guests came, now they are in the temple courts doing, mighty, doing holy works before the Lord. And that's what's happened to Paul. And that's what's happened to us. When we, when we met with Jesus, when, when we encountered him, we were common goods. We met with him and we became sanctified for holy purpose. We were saved, wonderfully won into new life, brought into something totally new. And as we were, we, our whole being changed and our purpose changed. This was a jug. Now, 
It stands in the Holy of Holies. Imagine somebody coming back at that time and going, actually, I, I wonder, could I, could I get that goat skin back? I was actually, it's, it's quite nippy tonight. I could do with it. Like, no, no, it's, it's not yours anymore. It's, that's not what it is. It's not a blanket anymore. It, it makes up the, the temple courts. That's what's happened. And why it's, it's why Paul can then speak to Timothy as he does when he says, don't get caught up in civilian pursuits. Don't, don't get entangled with those things and the priorities of the world. You don't belong to that anymore. You're not common goods anymore. You are set apart for holy purpose. You are a chosen instrument. So when Antioch comes and the call comes to leave this family, this church family, to move with Barnabas, Paul is not surprised that such a claim should be made on him because he knows he's not his own. He knows he doesn't belong to himself. He doesn't belong to his pension or to his holiday plans. He belongs to the Lord to be disposed of as he wills. He talks about the saints as the holy ones of God. This is, this is how uh, Paul will then go on to talk about the church. You're, you, you're the saints. You, you're the consecrated people of God. You are set apart for him. You belong to him. And so we need to understand this is, this is who we are. We're not who we once were. We have been set apart. And Paul recognises that having been set apart, having been a chosen instrument, he knows what he's a chosen instrument for. To, to be the chosen instrument, sorry, a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He, he recognises that, that this new commission he's received is going to take him into the nations. He, he recognises that having been transformed and having received new life, that, that the call now is to go into all the world. This is, and he starts doing it immediately, right? He doesn't wait for Antioch. He just, he's just doing it wherever he is. He's, I'm in Damascus. This, is, this just happens to be where the Lord encountered me. I'm, I'm in Damascus. I was here on other business. I'm not going to do that anymore. But I'm here, and so I'm going to preach the gospel here. And so he's not waiting for it to be spelled out in the stars for him. This is where you're to go. He, he knows that all the world must hear the gospel, and he has been made a chosen instrument to carry it. You know, sometimes, I think as Christians, we, we can be waiting. Oh, God, are you, are you calling me here? Are you, are you leading me here? And you think, like, the gospel must go. Yeah. And you are a chosen instrument. Yeah. Wherever you are, you are a chosen instrument. And God has called you to be where you are as much as he will ever call you to be anywhere in the future. So that's, I'm trying to work out if that sentence makes sense. Yeah. I heard, if, if it didn't make sense, I, I'm at least getting enough nods to think that you got the me- measure of it. Right? You, are, you are called to be a chosen instrument in every setting that you're in. And there may well be Antioch moments that say, right, now is the time to go. Now is the time to cross over. Don't go here. You know, the Macedonian call that you know, prevented us from entering Asia. Now into, um, into uh, 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 Macedonia. There are times when the Lord will direct you in that way, sure. But you, wherever you are, are a chosen instrument of God to carry his name to the nations and kings. Paul is, is, you know, he's, you, you see this. So as he's launched into it in, from Antioch, he, you see that he's, he's not, he, he doesn't want to get tangled up in, in any way. You see him just going from city to city. He just wants to take the gospel. And he's very quick as well to say, this isn't just me, by the way, guys. This is, this is on all of you. He says to the, to the Philippians, doesn't he? You know, I'm confident that he who began this work in you is, is going to bring it about to completion. And, and the reason he gives for that, what is the reason he gives for that? Well, it's right for me to think this way, he says. It's right for me to think this way about you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Right? For Paul, an evidence of someone's uh, belonging to Jesus is that they also belong to this mission. An evidence that somebody has been won totally won, heart and soul, by the Lord, is that they then take on this, this uh, great call that he has in, in making his name known to all the world. And Paul says, it is right for me to think of, this, of you in this way because of your partnership in the gospel. In other words, if you're a Christian, you're in on this mission. You've received this call. When someone is saved, like Paul was, they are transformed, they are set apart for new purpose. And we all have a share in this call to the nations. As regions beyond, we've, we've talked about this. I don't think there's anybody in the room who should, this should come as a surprise to. 
Um, we've talked about this as Regents Beyond, as we've, as we've held, again, this renewed call to, to take the gospel to the unreached peoples, to see churches planted across Europe and, into the, and across the UK as well. As we're thinking, no, there, there are nations that we're called to that we're not yet in. There are cities that we have been, uh, we've been made uh, uh, an object of holy purpose for. There are cities that that must receive the gospel uh, that we have been made the vessel of. As regions beyond, as I say, we've we've carried this. And so we're calling people to church planting. We're calling people to church planting. We're going to be hearing uh, uh, tomorrow just some of the things that we're we're wanting to do as as a movement in the UK to to help that, to to encourage people and to equip people to, to take part in this great mission that we're on. And it's wonderful as we, kind of, we, we hear some of the stories that are coming out f- uh, from brothers and sisters around the world. I've loved hearing some of the stories that have been coming out of the Philippines recently. You, know, you see some of these churches that are planted and you're thinking, wow, what is, what is God doing there? And just the, the movement, and you're thinking, I have a part in that. Because I'm saved, I have a part in that. I belong to that as much as anybody else. And it's wonderful. But also, this is, where the, this is a t- shift change now, sorry. Also, as, as Paul receives that Antioch call, in his mind is the other half of his call as well. So he says, it sets apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. What is the work to which you've called me? You've called me to nations and kings. And that's what you, know, you see as you go through Acts, nations and kings being reached with the gospel. But he's also called me to suffer for that same name. I will show him how much he will suffer for the sake of my name. Calvin, um, John Calvin, as he's writing his commentary in Acts, and he comes to this verse, he says this. This verse teaches us that only people who are prepared to suffer are fit to preach the gospel to a hostile world. And then he goes on. Therefore, if we want to be faithful ministers of Christ, we must not only beg him for the spirit of knowledge and wisdom, which is a prayer of mine always, (laughs) a spirit of knowledge and wisdom, but also for perseverance and strength so that we may never be discouraged by the desperate suffering that is the lot of the godly. Now let's remember, Calvin is not some uh, cosy academic sheltered away. Now he's living in in Europe that is uh, being torn apart by persecution. As, as people who are preaching the gospel faithfully are being burnt at stakes and, and killed by governments or in violent mobs. Right? He himself has, has fled his home in France uh, fearing for his life. Coming to Geneva, he's then supporting uh, many, many other missionaries who are travelling into nations where they are going to die. In fact, as he's writing his commentary in Acts, he's also writing letters to, uh, uh, to five Uh, young men, students, who have found themselves in the city of Lyon and they have gone there to preach the gospel. Immediately, they are are captured, taken to prison and and Calvin writes to them as he's writing Acts and and he's reading about Paul's suffering and he comes to this. He's also writing to these guys, encouraging them to stand firm in their faith, to encouraging them to say, not one drop of your blood will be spilt in vain. To say that, that all that, that you are accomplishing in your suffering will see the gospel's advance. He's writing. He's trying to help them. And he's writing to encourage them. And then they die. These five guys, they are burnt at the stake. All of them, their last words, oh, courage, brothers, courage. As they hold in their hearts this great commission that they've been given. The gospel must go to the ends of the earth. This is a man who knows and has really felt what it is he's talking about. And Paul, once again, makes it clear, hey, this isn't just for me. As he writes to the Philippians, he says to them, it has been granted to you, granted, like like a wish, (laughs) it's been granted to you, that you should not only believe in his name, but also suffer as part of the same conflict that you've saw in me, see Acts, (laughs) and now hear that I still am in. Right, you, you're engaged in the same battle that I'm in. You're suffering in the same way that I am because together we are seeing the gospel advance and we are preaching the gospel to a hostile world. Just quickly, I was, 
I was in a setting recently where I was able to speak to uh, some uh, dear Christians who had come from countries where uh, they would be killed if they were seen uh, going to worship or to, to pray together. Particularly this guy I was speaking to, he was uh, in a, a position of authority in that nation and so to, be, to have been uh, found to be worshipping the Lord, he would be, it would be, it would be over for him. Right? And, he, and he tells a story of how um, they would gather together and, and how they would find one another. And, and, and these guys, they're, they're doing everything they can in, to, to be able to worship in secret and, and to uh, be faithful with sharing the gospel with friends. Acts of great courage. And as I heard these stories, I have to say, there were, uh, there were a number of responses in my heart, but one of them was just a little bit of embarrassment. Some of the things that... I think I would hate for you to see some of the things that go on in churches in the UK. You know, where, where so easily we can make uh, our job about um, providing a good service. Right? Consumer-based, like how can I make you comfortable? How can I make you happy? And you think, like these guys have, know that there's something on the line. These guys know that, there's, that, this, that this faith demands something of them. Are we teaching our, our, are we teaching our people that that their faith might cost them their lives. And if it doesn't cost them their lives, then it's sure to cost them something else. Yeah. Are we teaching them that there is a cost to, what, to following Jesus? The call to mission is a call to be willing to suffer. That's a, a quote, I, I love it, um, from uh, Tacitus, and uh, my guys will have heard me say this before, um, just put up with me, guys. But Tacitus says, the Roman historian, he, he writes this, he says, um, not a spirit-filled man, just observing the world as he sees it. He says, the desire for comfort is the obstacle to every great and noble enterprise. The desire for comfort is the obstacle to every great and noble enterprise. Again, as I say, not a spirit-filled man, just looking at the great accomplishments of, of the world around him and seeing the people who have done these things have been people who have been willing to suffer for them. And here we see it in scripture, right? How is the gospel going to go? How is it going to be proclaimed to the nations? To, but in the suffering of the saints. How, uh, our master walked this road. Will we not also as his servants walk it? He, he was persecuted and killed for what he proclaimed. We now, holding that same message, walk out as sheep amongst wolves. This is the call. This is the call. The call to mission is a call to be willing to suffer. We know, all know this. And I'm, not, I'm not speaking to people. I know that no one in this room is ignorant of that. It's some, but it is something that we need to bear in mind as we talk as the, in the ways that we do about church planting, as we talk in the ways that we do about reaching the unreached. There are going to be people who drop everything, right? Life savings, house, family, lives, in order to see that that vision accomplished, to see that great and noble enterprise that we've been called to, won. It's going to be costly. And we can't talk about it as though it was some light thing with some cheap triumphalism. And I'm not saying that that's, that's where we are, but it would be so easy to talk about it in that way. And we need to be aware as we speak about these things, as we pray about these things, as we come to settings like this, anticipating that God's going to speak to us and lead us into new areas We've got to be aware that when that call comes, it is a call to suffer for his name. You know, when we stand up, and I stand up and I say, you know, we're looking for people to plant churches. I'm aware in that moment that I'm not offering platform and prestige. I'm offering, my, my offer is this, get in this pit with me. <laughs> get in this pit with me. You're needed. And as a church planter, I'm so aware you know, I have, I, people ask me, how's it going in freedom? And, and you know, you want to you share all the positive stories. And there, there are some, thank God, there are some great stories. But I tell you, you feel every bump. Like, right? You're riding close to the road. And, and even this week, we were, we were away and we came back. Um, and you're kind of catching up with stories. And, and, you know, in the course of a day, you're like, Phew, you know, as you catch up with every, every story that's been, been going on. And, and I was in this uh, moment, I was just praying, Lord, it feels like Freedom Church is this is this thing that you know, in, I'm holding in my hands and some slight change in temperature or gust of wind might kill the thing. Church planting is hard. 
It's hard. If we're serious about when we talk about reaching the unreached, if we're serious about our, our being able to respond to those Antioch calls, then we need to have settled in our hearts a willingness to lay everything down. And it's not something that can be done easily. It's not something that can be done naturally. Right? If I say, you know, when, when, when you know, the, uh, it's 1 Peter, isn't it, where, where Peter's saying, you know, these, you have, he's commending the church, you, know, you who have willingly and joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Right? That's not somebody, uh, I almost said that's not somebody in their right mind. That's not a natural-minded person, is it? <laughs> Thank God for you guys. Uh, that's not a naturally-minded person. That's somebody who's been filled with the Spirit, who recognises that they've been called to something greater, who recognises that in this world they are, they are exiles, awaiting a world that they've been called to, awaiting a kingdom that they belong to. You know, that, that verse when Paul says, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you know, we, we use it, and I, I don't think it's wrong to use it in the way they're saying, like, you know, great signs and wonders. When Paul's talking about, when he says that, he's talking about living with lack or living with plenty. You know, I can do both. I can do both. In the natural, I couldn't do either. But I can do both because of the power of Christ within me. I am able to live in lack and I'm able to live in abundance and I can jump from one to the other, from one to the other because of God in me who has called me to one purpose and all my wealth will be spent in one way. All that I am will be spent in one way. The Holy Spirit equips us not only to endure but to be able to rejoice in suffering. That... that uh, word that uh, Paul receives on, the, in, on his route to Damascus as, as, the, as Jesus comes to him and says, why are you persecuting me? He comes initially as a, a, a per, as, a, as a confrontation, doesn't it? Like, why are you persecuting me? But, but surely, and I must think, surely, as, as Paul faces uh, struggles and hardships of his own, as he faces persecution of his own as through, uh, later in the book of Acts, surely those words come back to his head, you know? Right? Every time the, the rod comes down or the stone is thrown or a riot breaks out, he's there and he remembers that Jesus so closely associates himself with his people that he's willing to say that any rock thrown is, a, is in a personal assault against me. He's with me. So Paul is able to say, he's with me. As the rod comes down, as the stone is thrown, he's with me, he's with me, he's with me. Why are you persecuting me? Suddenly becomes, um, goes from being a, a confrontational word to being a great comfort to Paul. He's with me. He is with me. Jesus looks, as I say, here is Freedom Church in my hand, feeling frail. Jesus looks at it and says, happily and proudly, that's mine. That is mine. And he puts his name to it. And any, any word spoken against it, any attack made against it, is a personal assault against me. Not only are we able to know the joy of Christ in our suffering, but we also rejoice in the knowledge that none of our struggles will be in vain. Here's the, the wonderful truth that we can enjoy. All of our suffering has been sanctified. All of our suffering has been sanctified. It all, again, has holy purpose. It's not in vain anymore. It's not for nothing anymore. No tear or drop of blood will be shed that doesn't advance the gospel. The Lord has purposed the sufferings of his saints in this way. It's not punitive. It is, although <laughs> there are times when it comes as, as, as corrective judgment, but it's not punitive in that way anymore. No, it is advancing the gospel. It is advancing the gospel. And Paul is so keen to, to make that known to the Philippians as he writes to them. You know, the struggles that we face. And, and I know, I am not ignorant of, of our settings and of, of the things that we go through. I know that um, people will have come here having had hard conversations, having had uh, teary prayer meetings, having, um, ca carrying weighty and painful things. And even as, you know, as we talk about church planting, I know that that can be wearying. Why you, you come, you, some people feel like they might have you know, belly crawled their way here and, and then talk of, of church planting and, uh, and, and suddenly it's, like, I, can't, I can't even bear to hear that, that, that phrase mentioned again. Right? I, can't, I can't bear to talk about church planting. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it. I, know, I tell you, it's, I know that it's hard. I know that it's hard, but nothing in the hardship will prevent it being done. 
Nothing in its hardship will prevent it being done for the Lord will accomplish his purposes through his people. And Paul is able to say from prison, I want you to know, and I think the reason he wants them to know is because he knows that they're suffering themselves. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And then throughout the book of Acts and his letters, we see Paul living out this call that we have, this, this great call to take the, the gospel to the nations and to kings and suffering. We see all of that happen. And it kind of comes to the head in Acts um, 26 as he's there before uh, King Agrippa. There he is, in chains. Enchained. Old scars and fresh bruises. He looks them in the eyes and, said, and says, I have been faithful. I have not been disobedient to the heavenly call. And then he says to them in pity, oh, if you were as I am. <laughs> Here he is, bruised and broken, enchained. If you had what I had, you would swap with me in an instant. This is the call that we have. This is the call that we have. And I want to be able to say, I want to be able to say, as Paul said then in that moment, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. I don't want to have anything left in the bank <laughs> by the when that time comes. I want to have spent everything, every part of myself on this great call that we have. Would you stand with me? And we're just going to, I, I think, I think as a response, I, I really feel... As I was preparing this, I was going to share with Ali just briefly. It's hard carrying a message like this because I wonder, you feel like, it feels a little bit lopsided. <laughs> right? You guys, they've come from across the UK and we're just going to talk about suffering. <laughs> but I really feel like there's something in, in, in what I'm sharing that, that is setting us up for something else. And so I really believe that, that now, this response from now is, is, is really a... Is, is enabling us to hear those Antioch calls that may come through the days of our time together. As we, as we hear about uh, what, it, what it's going to mean to, to serve the poor in this way. I hope as a nation goes through a great financial crisis, do you think that you'll be able to pass to your people without personal cost to yourself? And we've, got to, we've got to have reached that point, as I say, of, of having laid everything down. That yes that, that Sue said in her, in her word in worship earlier. That yes, not knowing what we're saying yes to. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to, to lay it all down. And coming from places of suffering, some of us ourselves, and saying, Lord, I'm trusting you even with this. I'm trusting you even with this to turn this for gospel advance. Lord, would you come? Lord, would you come? I just, let's, let's just pray. I wonder if you uh, put your hands out, the band could come up, it would be... Let's just. We've <coughs> received a, a Damascus like call. We have been recommissioned. We don't belong to the thoughts and, pr and processes and priorities of the world. We belong to another. We have been sanctified for holy purpose. And it's costly. The advance of the gospel will be costly. Lord, receive us as we are. God, receive us. Weak and frail, household goods, just put in the right hands. Now made into something for great and glorious purpose. Lord, we, we don't want to be people who, who are unable to say in those days that we were uh, faithful to the heavenly vision. Lord, we want to be people who, who hearing these things, and, and tomorrow as we hear the vision laid out before us, we want to be faithful to respond to it and not let any hang-ups or pains or or sufferings or potential sufferings get in the way of our being obedient to you. Come, Lord.